Welcome to the March 2nd uh, Zoning Advisory Committee meeting. Hello, everyone. Hello. I haven't heard from John, so I don't know if he's going to be here. Have you heard from him? Uh, okay, so our agenda tonight is discussion of the conversions of residential property and um, the duplexes. Um, and John helped um, by sending us an excerpt of the zoning bylaws with those pages in it. Also, Stonewall guidelines. I think this will be a preliminary discussion of what we can do about that. And then just a generalized discussion of objectives for the upcoming year. Yeah. Hopefully, people might have new, new and fun ideas for zoning. And, <laughs> um, and uh, we should also make sure to schedule the next few meetings in around everything else going on in town. Okay, so starting with the um, the zoning that John sent us. Uh, so at the, at the bottom of the first page of this PDF is the conversion of residential property. This is an uncharacteristically very short Thank you. zoning by law. <laughs> The conversion of any house for rental purposes to accommodate not more than four dwelling units may be undertaken in any zoning district except Industrial A or Industrial B. District upon grant of a special permit by the Board of Appeals, provided that the exterior is not materially altered, and provided that each dwelling unit so created contains a floor area of at least 600 square feet, and two parking spaces shall be provided on site. So it's a pretty simple article. And um, my question really is, is there any interest in any changes to this article? Understanding the objective is really just to make it possible for affordability in this town. But, um, you know, echoing what I've heard um, in previous public forums and so on, that there's some concern about, you know, somebody buying up a bunch of properties and converting them to rental units. So, um, so not wanting that to be going on in a lot of places. Where, uh, I'm sorry, I can't find this. It's in here somewhere? 210125. 210-125. Conversion. Page 84. 84. Page 84 of it's the printed version. I know. It's two pages, uh, so it's really. Sorry, yeah, that's quite all right. Nice. Nice. Now you found it. Okay. Even out so, of the establishment. For me, so. Oh, yeah, nice. Right up front, it seems like. I like it. Two parking spaces shall be provided on the site for each dwelling unit. Could that become uh, a barrier for entry? Like I would think so. It, yeah. Oh. I would think so too. That was the first thing it, it, right. I now, just I was like because six hundred square feet yeah. is pretty small. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So of course the the other side of that is that you know that's that's what's preventing um, there being a lot of street parking going mm -hmm. on. Yeah. I guess purely from an affordability perspective, if that's yeah. where we want to take the discussion, should we discuss, should this two still be enforced, or is there a mm -hmm. way to reduce that to maybe one or something along those lines? Yep. does seem uh, okay. yeah, appropriate. Uh, at least relax it for certain zones instead of all. So if, there is, if it's a completely residential, it doesn't have to be two parking spaces for each. Change. To parking requirement. Anyone else? Just general comments, thoughts? I, I think two is excessive. I think you could change it to provided that all vehicles at the location are provided off street parking. Okay. You know, all vehicles that are being habitually garaged there. But this would be a rental unit, so it will vary. It'll change. True. But as a, as a general rule, I'm not necessarily in favor of paver, paving over, you know, I eight know. parking spots for four single people living in a house. No, changed 
parking requirement in one space or sufficient spaces. Okay. Mary, Mary, was there any concern about this article? Was there someone that came to us on this? Well, where did this come from? One of the articles that deals with rental properties, basically. Right. So it's among those that Tom Terry, you know, highlighted okay. to us. Um, and I'm not saying that it does need any changes. I'm just saying that you know, okay. there's discussion. So because this. As well as, you know, the one we, we just put forward, accessory family dwelling unit, and the duplexes one, are the three that really deal with smaller units other than single family homes, you know. So. It seemed to think we talked about this last year, didn't we? We may have. I'm not saying we shouldn't have, but I, I thought I remembered something about the owner of the property had to live in one of the units. And this one, this one doesn't have. You're, you're thinking of the accessory. No, because we didn't do that last year. We did that two and three years ago. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly so we didn't right. Do that last year. <laughs> and maybe, we, maybe it didn't get voted in in town meeting. Maybe I'm making it up. Okay, I can check the work plan. Um, it's that, so hard to just, remember. Just give us. <laughs> What was done last year? Uh, Stay after meeting. forty, your brain cells start going away. I bring it up not because I think that should or should be the rule. If we did talk about it last year, I'd be interested in what we did. Yep. We should always learn from what we've done before. So, <laughs> one other point that I noted was this does not make a requirement for each unit to have its own bathroom. I was wondering about that too. I, I don't know. Or kitchen or, area, or all, all kitchen area. You're right, <laughs> or any of exactly. I mean, is the implication that those would be a shared space? I think it's part of the building code. In order for it to be, I, 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 that would be what, my guess. Yeah, what's our terminology? Is it dwelling unit or what does it say in there? Because I'm still looking up that. Uh, uh, four dwelling <laughs> units. Yes, <laughs> dwelling units. But dwelling I think units, yeah. I don't think what there's defines any a dwelling unit. That you can't yeah. Have so, is there a definition of dwelling unit? In so the there must be somewhere. Um, so, or in this. Let's go look. look. <laughs> yep. They didn't say anything about bathroom. But ah. they are not considering the rolling units rolling units if they don't have a kitchen. You can share yeah. a bathroom but not a kitchen. Interesting. That's bizarre. <laughs> so I don't find it in last year's town meeting notes. So but we definitely talked about it. It's just that we have I don't think we put anything forward. Um the, the definition in, in the zoning bylaws for dwelling unit, a room or a group of rooms forming a habitable unit for one family with the facilities which are used or intended to be used for living, sleeping, cooking, and eating. Oh, no showering. Living. <laughs> no living. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, I mean... Could you define cooking as a, a heating pad and a microwave? Yes, you could. I mean, it could be it could be very modest cooking. I'm sure it gets up to the um, state level at that point as to right. and that constitutes a uh, kitchen. Yeah, I'm, uh, but the, the definition that we have to work with is pretty vague. So correct, but there is um, there are certain requirements. And I don't know them off the top of my head for rental units. That if you rent, you need to provide the renters with certain appliances. Right, but this is dwelling unit different from a rental unit? Well, this section is specifically for rental dwelling units. Okay. So they would they would have to conform to state laws. Mm. I don't know if they either need to provide a stove or they need to provide a refrigerator or one of the two, both of them. I don't remember. So, 
so it it's contained mostly contained in the rental dwelling units concept is a bathroom and kitchen you know kitchen definitely the bathroom, the bathroom. So but the, you know when it says living i mean you know so the, the needs we, of living i mean the way that this came up today um was with the fairview estates uh -huh. um the units that are used for on-site managers mm -hmm. are not considered dwelling units right because they don't have kitchens right and they are they are potentially changing that to the meeting to make those <coughs> dwelling units. There's issues with the Osmond unit count. Right. But we we discussed it last year at a town meeting. Yeah, I remember this. It came up last year. Right. But I'm saying I don't know if they have bathrooms. But they, so that wasn't the distinction that town council was making. Is that it was said kitchens. They're not dwelling units because they don't have kitchens. Mm -hmm. They may have bathrooms, and maybe that's a, you know that's why the point is moved on those. But they were making the distinction that it needs to have bathroom, or kitchens. I think the assumption is that it's that it has a bathroom. Yeah, I agree. I don't think uh, we need to make any changes based on that. It's not on our occupied requirement, which I think is appropriate for for this particular bylaw. Mm -hmm. um, it's really only is the parking requirement too much. Right. So. I agree. It may not have been too much one time in the past but now it is yeah exactly. you could use a scooter a bicycle you could walk yeah. okay. so um this is just about conversion but some of the things again it was uh i was writing the notes down it may have been tom terry was saying this or it was some of the discussion that took place afterwards or in the um, the more recent discussions on it with us. Um, another step in affordability, allowing more flexibility for house conversions or new construction of apartments, possibly um, fewer limits on the number of units per building, for instance. So right now it does say up to four. Now that, but this is just for conversion. I cannot quite picture any house that could be converted without substantially altering the exterior of the house into something with more than four units that would all have 600 square feet of space at least you know i don't think that i agree with really you. a need do you yeah so i don't know there i just flipped somewhere else inadvertently but there's a parking space reduction clause that says that if if you want to reduce it you can go get a special permit provided that um, uh, wait a minute. Uh, they need to make a determination that provision for parking spaces proposed will be adequate for all parking needs okay requirement can be reduced by special permit okay does that mean you need a special permit to convert and a second special permit Right, you would, do one would, hearing. Yes, yes. You get one, one hearing, two things. Yep. You can't do one hearing, two things. You do three things. So it, it seems really odd that this section is so short because many of the other things that we discussed in the past, accessory family dwelling and all those things, do have a requirement for separate ingress and egress. This does not have that. Yet it also says exterior should not be materially altered. How do you achieve that if you need to have four different entrances into the apartment uh, home because it's four units now? Uh, how do you do that without? So it could, I, it could be this, one center entrance. Yeah, yes. off of that. I yeah, think. Like I think. Flats, think that's, you, know, you know. I think the the general idea, Sundar, is that um, if you had a large older house that was appropriate to be split into four units, but surrounded by single family houses. It wouldn't change the character of the neighborhood. Okay. That was. And that seems to be the, the only requirement yeah. of this of this conversion okay. bylaw is that you're not making it look out of place. It does require a grant of a special permit by Board of Appeals, so that yeah. essentially could become the uh, limiting factor as well. That's true. Because that could be subjective. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's almost always granted. Okay. You know, so. Do you think that Mr. Terry was looking for us to loosen this particular bylaw? He, he specifically said 
I'm not suggesting any specific change, just in general would like you guys to look at changes right. overall to make things more so since accessible. Windsor at Hopkinton came online though I mean we've just got a ton of apartments yeah. so maybe this is now kind of a moot point it may be I don't I don't think I mean there's always going to be the the situation of huge houses that might you know, right. might be economical to convert. Yeah. Know, but typically in college towns. <laughs> you know? um, I certainly lived in my fair share of those types of apartments. Um, they tend to be more affordable to them. Yeah. Than the new, than new, oh, yeah. Apartments. Oh, yeah. new luxury apartments. So, <laughs> yeah. But at least there's an apartment stock that wasn't here just a couple of years ago. I sure. mean, that's between the Wood Partners Project at Legacy plus this one. I and mean, we've got a lot of apartments now. Oh, yeah. We absolutely do. Okay. So I don't see any big changes that we can make to this one. I mean, other than the parking. Uh, Possibly the parking. But yeah. if they can get a waiver through through a special permit. If they're going to go for if they're going to go for a special permit anyway to, to alter the building they can go in and get a reduction of parking space yes. okay so, at the same sorry. time i was just gonna yeah parking is the only thing but since it's got to be a special permit anyway yeah so i have just a question i don't know if it will apply for the scenario because it says uh it, this is applicable for every zone except industrial a and industrial b but i i can i can imagine there could be lower rate wage em employees in, it, who would like if there is a affordable housing in industrial A, industrial B, maybe they take it up and I don't even know if there are houses in industrial A or industrial I don't either. I don't think there, there are. are. Um, I don't think there are any houses. I mean, there well, the existing there's houses. Yeah, so the very few. Very, very few. Very very few. few. And I, I would I would guess that we want to keep that zone for commercial only. Uh, yeah, uh, because we want to make money out of the commercial. No, no, I agree with that. That's why I thought like, yeah. if, it's, uh, if the loss is conversion of any house, so if new houses cannot come in, so people can't exploit that rule, right. even if we lose it for industrial right. A and industrial B, but if there is an already existing house which is not mm -hmm. being occupied, maybe we loosen the rules for that, maybe. So the only thing I can think of is, is um, the concept of the work live play zones, you know, the... So if we're doing that in industrial A or B, you know, then then housing should be there. So, right. But I don't I, think I this is the year to fight for more housing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it is. No. But it, but in in the future, if we're going to have um, better quality of life designs for planning, then there has to be some residential with that. Yes. In the future, that's the only thing. Yeah. In any case, that uh, 210 125 does not apply Correct. to introduction of Correct. Uh, right. Correct. That's a brand new model. Okay. So I'm going to um, to put that aside as as not you know not currently needing you know, major changes. I'm so surprised that right after duplexes is animal shelters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It just seems like very strange <laughs> organization. Uh, yeah. yeah, the experiment. Kind of Thank you. Throw everything in. Okay. Yeah. Yep. There you go. Okay. So duplexes. I am definitely not going to read the entire duplex, um, which which spans two and a half pages. Um, but essentially, it is talking about new construction. It is talking. Um, about I was very surprised by this if you look under B4 that at least one unit of the duplex has to be set aside as permanently affordable and count toward the 10% statutory goal which is um, amazing and probably why we don't have many duplexes <laughs> Constructed in new construction. So, um, 
I understand some of the other restrictions. There should be no more than one duplex per lot, not other um, dwelling units on the same lot, that sort of thing. Um, but um, also under B2, um, it talks about the percentage of existing two-family dwelling units not being above 5% of the total. So, and that it, it doesn't, this gives a very specific res, uh, restriction to the Board of Appeals. The Board of Appeals doesn't even have the opportunity to grant a special permit if we're above 5% here. I don't think we are above 5% for two family dwellings. Um, so, Madam Chairman, but are we looking at this again with an eye for improving yes. this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, it was, it, it's nice. At the beginning, in the first paragraph, it talks, it talks about in order that a range of housing options affordable to all citizens be available in the town. So th that was the, the intent of this article. Got it. I'm only aware of one duplex in town. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm only aware of one. It's all right around the corner from the end. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so there's a few, but this is just for new family, uh, just for new construction, excuse me, and not about um, converting. I don't know if there's any opportunities within this one. Is the term affordable defined as part of the bylaws? Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, John, do you want to? Give a brief description of how that works with the with the affordable. So affordable is defined at the state level as um, a certain percentage of rent for uh, those making eighty percent of the area median income. So there's certain rent tables out there from the state that say in. The Boston, Somerville, Cambridge metro area. This is the median income for one person. So 80% of that uh, would be this income, and people making that or less would pay X rent on a one family or one bedroom apartment. This much rent on a two bedroom apartment, that type of thing. Regardless of the market valuation of the rent? Yes. In that situation, is the owner eating the cost, or what, how exactly? What incentivizes the owner to do that? Um, well, in this case, the fact that they can do a duplex, so they'd be making it's rent off of more than five percent oh, okay. the one market rate unit, and then they would still be making rent off of the affordable unit, just wouldn't be as much. Okay. So I mean, depending on how much their this costs the are, they can still either. turn a profit. They just wouldn't be turning that much of a profit. So in other situations, it's this one's kind of different because it's basically one unit for one unit, essentially. But in, for example, um, Chapter 40B developments, you can do, uh, you have to do 25% affordable. So in order to get the provisions of Chapter 40B, which are essentially don't have to do, don't have to conform to zoning in the town, you can do a multifamily development as long as you do 25% affordable. So you do. In a, in a town that might not allow a certain density of units, you could do more than that density, make the income off of the market rate properties, and then you have 25% affordable. Mary, you could loosen this up, but I don't think this is the year to do this either. No, no. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't it wouldn't come around until 2021, but it's still. But still, we're we're still choking right now. Yeah. I think one of the difficulties is finding affordable without creating more housing. Yeah. You know? uh, and again, I, before John puts it in the minutes the second time, I am not proposing this. <laughs> but if there was a rule that said the smaller houses in the center of town could not be knocked down, those would become a much more affordable home option in the center of town without creating more housing and more strain on other things that we have. But I, I'm not proposing that either. It seems to me that's the kind of thing that could get by town meeting to 
ensure more affordable housing without straining the schools and the buildings. And I think that's powerful. Because I think what that would mean is you have to stay in the historic district and I think the neighborhood I live in already said loudly they don't want to do that because they want to sell their houses. Even if someone wants to knock it down, they put a bigger house up. So. <laughs> the other issue you have with that is um, kind of what's going on with 83 Main Street and potentially 76 Main Street mm -hmm. where it's demolition by neglect mm -hmm. and the problems that come along with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think that's a place where we're stuck. One way to get more cheap housing is more small units. That puts straight in the other place for a little frustrating. We're kind of here as a tie that can go over. And the strain on the school system, of course, is it? And the households, police, fire, all the other things that get strained. Okay. I am going to put both of these on the bottom of our list <laughs> um, <laughs> um, because I think they always bear considering changes as things around here change. But I agree that you know there's not an appetite for it right now. There's nothing obvious in either one of these that is glaringly in need of change, <laughs> like there, like there was in the accessory family dwelling unit. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what discussions take place at town meeting so that we'll learn from too. So, okay, good. And next one is stone walls. So, I think I went through this last time. Is that planning board has asked us to create some stone wall guidelines, and they are guidelines. Um, I I don't know where they would reside, but nonetheless, um, pl <laughs> the planning department would figure that out, land use. <laughs> um, and that is um, to, planning board has some, some um, authority over the stone walls alongside scenic roads. Um, I think it's with, are they, are they within the public way or are they not within the public way, do you know? They don't no. necessarily have to be in the public. They just way. have to be along there. Okay, the just the along the public. Okay. Is there so, also something about stone walls just in the woods? Are those protected in some way or another as well? So the planning board only has jurisdiction over stone walls within the public way, the right of way. Okay. Within the right of way on scenic roads. So. Yes. So that's usually, you know, within like, I don't know, five feet or so of the road, more or less. 25 feet off the center line, right? For the most part? Depends 20 road away. 20? Okay. It's 20 on scenic roads. But my, my suspicion is that if um, if we were to create guidelines, it is something that that some people, even who um, who you know aren't under that jurisdiction of planning board, would be interested in some help protection you know, they, of the they, existing stone walls. Yeah, if they want to, you know reshape their stone wall in the, the backyard of their house and they want to maintain the historical character of it, these guidelines could possibly help. That's, you know, so I'm, but they're specifically for the planning board for the scenic road jurisdiction. So um, the problem is that, that we say in planning board, we say um, if you need to remove a section for some, you know, egress for for you know like putting an addition on or whatever and then you're replacing the stone wall that you replace it in the same way or if it has tumbled down you know that you just replace those stones and you don't like build it up more more so um or use um stuff from a quarry <laughs> you know you just use those stones and and obviously people take liberty with what that means to them you know so um so I think that I think that if there's any um, input we can get from local um, historical societies, not just not just Hopkinton, but 
others in New England who all deal with that same kind of stone wall. Um, there may be some guidelines out there that we can, you know. So I just found this, this has a lot of teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, in Massachusetts, whoever willfully, without right to close down or removes any portion of the stone wall, blah, 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 uh, can be punished with a fine of not more than $10. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to put it back? Dollars. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't it beg a basic question. So if, if, I, if, if I wish to build a decorative stone wall, am I required to get permission from the town? Within my own property? I don't. Yeah. So by the same token, pulling down something, I mean, yes, yeah. the, the, the goals are noble here. Oh, yeah. No, and that's, and so there's still... Evidently, evidently, there's a Massachusetts <laughs> state law that says you're going to be fined, but you can. The rest of the whole world, but you can You can pull it down on your property. So, the planning board does have jurisdiction over things on scenic roads, sure, in front of people's houses. So, because that's those are in the public way. But after the act has been complete, uh, completed, <laughs> a ten dollar fine is no, 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 no. That the, the the planning board jurisdiction is over and above that. There's you know, okay, yeah. There's but there's that, more than got it. Do we all take a turn and just research different towns? Sure, and, and and just come back the next meeting. Yeah, whatever. That's we what get. I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it it does it is intriguing. It is. <laughs> and also, I figure, you know, we can take pictures of examples. These are, this is a good example. This is a bad example. <laughs> well, it's interesting, too, because if you drive around <clears throat> Hopkinton Scenic Roads, the stone wall methodology varies oh, drastically yeah. between this side of town and that side of town and over here and over there. And, you know, the farmer that might, may have lived on our property, like, you know, several hundred years ago, did a bad job of piling the stone walls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I guess my question was more basic in nature. If when I buy a property mm -hmm. which contains a historic stone wall, is there any guidelines I get from the town as a house homeowner that this shall be preserved in this form? Because day one I could come and knock it down. If at, at one point the planning board was sending out or had intended to send out to residents who purchase properties on scenic roads saying these are the rules. I don't know whether that do. ever happened. We still do. Regularly. Okay. 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 For scenic roads, for scenic but not roads. for I mean, uh, I ha I have some in the back of my so property. To expand on Ted's yeah. uh fine. <laughs> the, the actual language of the section says, uh, whoever willfully and without right pulls down or removes any portion of a stone wall or fence which is erected or maintained for the purpose of enclosing land. So if you, have oh. a, if you have a wall on your property that's not intended to serve as the boundary or enclose your land, there's no protection for that wall. <laughs> but what if that was the original intent of it? Yeah. But that's not the purpose of the wall now. Hmm. I think this is more to, to so have people not... So it anything historical. Right. That's not the goal. Correct. Right. It's not even aesthetic in nature. It is yeah. functional in nature. Yeah. I, I, I'm wondering what's the... Point. I'm going to put a fence, an electric fence, and all sorts of fancy fences, but not <laughs> removing the no. stone yeah. fence. No, it's just the charm. Hmm. <laughs> but even the law has not been written in that a big no, fancy no, house. Has no, the Massachusetts no, state law has, no, yeah. has no law Farmers stone protecting these historic stone, right? Right? Mm, stone really laws. Not. And, and we can only protect the ones that are on senior crops. Street. But the there guidelines could be thing. used by homeowners who want to preserve them in other parts of their property. It could be used. I'm not saying it will be. Okay. It is primarily for the scenic roads. I feel it, it should stay there. Okay. And okay. Which it should it's, be removed from the... It's not, it's not oh, there. Oh, it's not even there. It's oh, not okay, there. okay. No, got it, got it, got it's it. not anywhere else. Okay. I'm just saying that you know maybe somebody who's looking for that information would also find this useful. Okay. But, okay. Okay. Well, Bosch seems to have a lot, and I'm trying to digest Okay. So that's your homework. Okay. Heads on Fox, but I will go pick up the That and Airbnbs, so. Yes. Any public comment on this? Come on up. 
So uh, I'm Craig Nation, 279 Wood Street. I've uh, lost a couple fingernails doing stone walls <laughs> falling away. Uh, something I think, I think the stone walls of New England are fascinating and I think it's important to know about their history from as you guys are researching. Um, but look back at how these have been maintained and have they've gone up and down over the generations. I think Robert Thornson is his name. He's written some good books on stone walls in New England. And you know, he'll start from the beginning explaining how the ice age, the last ice age that came, you know, brought these rocks from the Appalachian Mountains and dumped them here for us. So these rocks have been uh, tumbling around New England for a long time. And originally farmers would would uh, clear their field and they'd put all their un uncomposted trash on their property line. And then the next generation came along and all the stumps and stuff would be um, gone. And they had these piles of rocks. And they, what do we do with these? Well, we'll organize them a little bit. And that's why you see some near the houses are organized neater. And as it goes into the back lot, they sort of are in different conditions that some of them are not so attractive anymore. Sometimes they're they're not even recognizable as a wall. They're just, they're knocked over, trees fall over. Mm -hmm. And this, over the generations, they've been organized. They've been built up nice. And some places have fallen down. And then, like me, I've fixed my walls along my property line. I don't know. Uh, I just think it's important to know that you might not want to make it a no, a not a no-touch thing. Because for generations, they've been built up and fall down and built up again. And again, near the houses, they're organized neater and things. So I'm not sure where you're going with the, with the rule. I get it. I think it has uh, some merit, but just be careful. I would hate to have it. So don't touch this. Well, why can't I touch it? It's a mine. Why can't I fix it or make it look better? I think thus far, it's it's been very loose at the right. planning board. It's just been like, well, just try to rebuild it the way it probably used to be. And so they're just asking for a little bit more than that, and I don't think we would want to go further than a little bit more than that. So, and kind of the idea is being, and again, this is from the planning board, that the general guidelines that have been given in the past verbally have been just use the stones that are there. That's the one. And two, yeah, if it's all tumbled down, feel free to rebuild it. If you want to. <laughs> Just tough to reuse the stones that are there because, again, as you'll see if you read some Mostly history ground. on them, they've been pillaged and robbed. You know, a lot of them used to be four foot high walls everywhere, and people have come along and found better uses for these rocks and moved some of the bigger ones here and there. Landscapers come steal them. Some theories are uh, why are they the height they are now? If there were all these rocks in New England, we knew there were plenty of rocks to make a huge wall. Well, people had trucks, and they were conveniently out of height that they could just throw them back in the truck. And <laughs> now their walls a short wall. Uh, yeah. And originally, they were made of mules. Uh -huh. I don't know. They're pretty neat. They're all over the place. I know. They're great. Start when you start doing some research on them, you'll start noticing them more. Uh, I, know. I know. They're beautiful, and I I love I love thinking but about them. For generations, they've been, people didn't know what to do with them. They are just trash to people, and now here they are. And you'll find lots of cool relics of things, little coins and bottles. There's so many neat things that you'll find when you get into a wall and fix it or remove it. Or well, thank you. I don't know. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's all. Okay. okay. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Just know the history about them before you make rules. That's Definitely. All. I agree. Okay. So that's our homework. Sure. And okay. So um, so in terms of our objectives for the next year. Okay. Can someone remind me when do we when do we have a um, turnover of new members is that september i think so okay yeah it's not right after town meeting right it's september no, but i don't think it's september yeah, i thought it was the summer it, it might be August. june 30th yeah. maybe hmm? it might be june 30th oh okay okay, okay. so all right i thought when we started this format that it was a september one start 
that led up to town meeting it but then the change was we have to keep meeting all year round because there's too much to do just to get to town meeting but i thought it was a september 1st i think the terms end on june 30th but i think we did all the board organization in september i can i can check on that. yeah double check okay because i think that it um it will affect what we want to well for instance i don't i don't want to have you do the training for us on the form-based zoning probably until new members are here so we wouldn't do it right at the end of a set of terms you know so but everybody's going to roll over right everybody's going to stay with us <laughs> so so that's what I'm trying to think of of uh, proper timing for things yes that says our term is August 31st to August 28th okay. hmm. actually John Coutinho is a little different he's September 7th August 31st but, <laughs> but that's, isn't it that so they, ch they changed over the um, board tracking format because that's not how it used to be so they they probably updated that so i would just so you're saying that might not be right i would say the start dates are probably not correct the end dates are august 31st is probably correct but i will confirm that okay. and i know we have in the past sometimes um sometimes been delayed by planning board not quite getting the next steps done because they have to they have to take some steps in the summer and sometimes that doesn't happen in the summer so yeah okay okay so i would like to hear any ideas people have or have heard um talked about as as potential areas for discussion whether they're on our list or not <laughs> anything well i mean i I'd like to try to explore something for South Street mm -hmm. to try to better utilize some of the underutilized facilities there to create some kind of an economic development zone. And I don't, I'm not even sure what that looks like other than it, it's not a, a WeWork type uh, communal use thing, but, but almost more of a cooperative thing to have a, a variety of different kind of businesses coming into i mean 80 south street was kind of the original target now it looks like we might have a manufacturing facility in there but that type of a building that's been sitting there underutilized and and try to create something to to just get some more amenities onto that side of town including recreation i hope maybe yeah, absolutely okay yeah well Ron, can you identify the properties that you feel that um, we could f shape the zoning around that? Because sure. 80, I mean, South 80, Street, 80 South Street was... 80 South Street was the perfect one. To, yeah, or, it's, a perfect, it's a perfect property to do transitional zoning for sure. Yeah. But the seller or the owner was not very receptive to doing anything. For the longest time, plus we we used the property Indeed. when this building was down. Can I ask you what you mean by transitional zoning? So, um, I made an offer on the property on behalf of my client, which was for independent senior living. Perfect transitional zoning because you've got housing on one side and you've got commercial on the other side and they just never responded to the offer mm -hmm. okay so that's you know like you can try but if they, you know, nobody's receptive to it then it doesn't go anywhere so there's got to be some incentive involved with you know uh, doing those kinds of transitional zoning uses uh, also Mary a hotel in my mind is a sort of a transitional use between commercial and residential it's a low traffic use as long as it doesn't look like the red roof in mm -hmm. in Southboro which was housing 
all kinds of you know people that didn't have a house by the state but today you can't build something that would be you know that works that way okay thank you but how so, is that different than the housing overlay district that we currently have you mean the hotel overlay? i mean the hotel overlay I mean, we currently have that in the zoning right right well we have the hotel overlay district because we wanted hotels but there's no appropriate site right now for a hotel <laughs> believe it or not i mean those buildings are full where the hotel where overlay, the overlay district is, is. They're full, so you can't go and say, oh, well, we're just going to turn this into a hotel. There's tenants paying rents. I mean, there have been a number of hotel proposals brought to town hall that have been turned down, and those w were cited in appropriate areas within the housing overlay district. In the hotel overlay district? hotel overlay district. Um, well, who turned them down? I don't town know. meeting. Finn Perry brought it forward. When? Oh, you're talking years ago that went through Zach. It was three or four years ago. I, I would guess longer. I, I was on Zach at that point. I would say it was longer ago than that, but yeah. they had a whole mixed, mixed use yeah. development going down on Elmwood. Right, Elmwood it was Park. not just a hotel that was that wouldn't have made the project feasible for all the the only reason I bring that up is that there are parcels within the hotel overlay district that are suitable for a hotel but if, they're if not the developer... available though Ron they're not available right now they're filled they're filled yeah I it, I, I would ask Finn Perry about that because I, I was working for Finn Perry I know I, I was the listing agent for his property <laughs> He's, he's filled it. Okay. So, Ron, you were going to... Um, I'll work on some additional and, yeah. specific I mean, addresses. Okay. Yeah, that would be helpful, and then we can go from there. We voted at Good. town meeting last year to allow recreational along South Street, right? Yeah. And I, I myself shut up the idea of the Apex. But the other day, just because I was curious, I stopped by the new athletic center on Route 9 in Wellesley where that church used to be that said we're still here forever and ever. That place is amazing. Has anyone stopped in there? It's got a huge pool. It's got two ice rings. It's Wait, it's owned pools. by Wellesley, though. No, no, I'm just saying. The project is owned by Wellesley. That type of recreation would be oh, so the town owns it? Yes. It's got a, it's got a corporate-looking sponsor on the outside. Maybe they're... Right, maybe they did a partnership of some sort, but no, it was, it was a Wellesley... It was a well oh, is that, yeah. does, that, does that suggest that it's not a profitable move for a private? It's probably a not for profit. No, but does that mean it's not likely to be a profitable type? Of thing? Like, does that? Oh, no, 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 no. They, they, the, the town. When my recollection is that the town went out of its way to make that deal happen because there was a need. They didn't have enough um, right. recreational space in the town, and they had teams and. I, I'm, I bring it up to say I wonder if there's a private person that might see uh, I don't know where the empty spots are in such uh, It seems to me that, unlike some other things I've heard, would have a high tax value because of the value of all the stuff inside of it. Uh, there could be some traffic as hockey games come in. Uh, but I don't know business. I don't know if that's only possible in Wells and baseball because they're not looking to make a profit or if it is possible. I don't know how to tell the people, hey, you know, so uh, I, I, I would bring up the set as impressed. And whereas I was worried about recreational uses, because I think an apex is a horrible idea on South Street, that seemed to me to be something. <laughs> we need a debate. That, 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 that is the other end, right? So apex is the other end of the, right, uh, right. multiple recreation centers coming into one. Like having at least something come yeah. into town would be yeah. would be good. Yeah. And space-wise, just the size of the lot and building, it seems to be similar to what's in the lot. So, so I, I, I was struck by it and thought, hey, I, I like this thing. I can see this for Sussex. Well, yes, you're right. Last year's town meeting did vote to allow it by special permit in Industrial A, mm -hmm. so, which is the right place. 
When, Ria, when you said Wellesley allowed that because there was a paucity of recreational space, do we have that same situation in, in Hopkinton? The demand? Or no? Well, they're, they're, the, they're supposed to be a hockey and a, and a museum on the east side of town here um, as part of the proposal of Legacy Farms. I don't know, the hockey part of it may have fallen apart, but... I think they backed out of it. Yeah. I mean, it's money. It's, these things cost a lot of money, and you know, unless you have someone who really wants to finance it. It's Fair enough. But indoor recreation, I, th I believe there is a demand. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's probably a need uh, for hockey here in town. Um, but it, it, those things go on a cycle, too. They're not, they're, it's not always, it's a, it's a demographic um, they cycle and so if you have a lot of kids I mean I, I just remember the skating rinks closed in my area after they were building for a number of years and it, it just was a big box at the end of the day um, so you have to look at are you going to use this land for uh, high tech jobs good jobs or are you going to lose use this land for big box retail and, and recreation. I mean, I, I just, you know, I think that our town fathers had some smarts here way back when. And have we, we attracted people and companies that, you know, want to be here and take part of the educated workforce? And I'm with you. That's my favorite use. Yeah. I just happen to see this in the place. I think gonna be yeah, so it, it, it's coming to me now. That it was a church, so the church doesn't pay taxes, right. and so the town fathers there got this operator to come in. But I do believe it is a town. It's owned by I do believe it's owned by town. Yeah. It's yeah. very impressive. Yeah. Whatever it is. Oh no, it's really state of the art. <laughs> it's state of the art it, for sure. It's really very cool. It's, it's super the It's an indoor soccer field. It's a huge pool. Fitness center. It's really pretty nice. Well, the the Boston. No, I should say. Anyhow, I don't remember the name of it. But anyhow, the tennis club that they're building. Mm -hmm. you now that's <coughs> gone through most of the changes. Now, did we vote on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> we, Great. so we approved it. <laughs> um, and so you know now the, it's. Some of the that come now. to mind are. Uh, but that's membership. You know. The two, two facilities that come to my mind are uh, Four Kicks in, in Marlboro mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think John Smith Soccer, yep. both of which the advantage is um, you have a demographic all the way from very young kids who are playing soccer in winter all the time mm -hmm. to adults who are now using that for cricket practice and midnight football and uh, places like John Smith and Four Kicks, there are Indians who go and play cricket there, yep. reserve a slot from 10 p.m. till midnight, it's AstroTurf. So that place is hardly closed in the sense, yeah, it is closed from midnight to 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. in the morning, but there is so much regular use of that. So that hopefully can address, or this will go out of fashion and at some point it'll get mothballed. Uh, because a lot of people I know do use those kind of facilities literally for you know playing soccer, yeah. like 10 people, go and rent that place or, or for cricket. I mean, again, changing demographics, right? Yes, and I, th I think the cricket is fairly new for John Smith. In fact, John Smith was up for sale like a couple of years ago. I don't know I if it, it still is. It still is, yeah. So right. it, it being up for sale kind of means that it's tired, it needs to have reinvestment in it and right. those kinds of things. And that that's hard to do. No, fair enough. The only, yeah. the only point I'm trying to make is we are focused on the demand within our community mm -hmm. and I think it's a little bit more than that. My friends go to Uxbridge to play soccer. <laughs> they go to some other town, Westboro or some place to play cricket even though they live in either Ashland or Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. So it almost feels like build it and they will come <laughs> kind of a thing. I'm not suggesting that is necessarily yeah. true of all places. But again, depending on how it is, Four Kicks is a classic example. Mm -hmm. People from multiple towns, not just Marlboro, Hopkinton, uh, and uh, Hudson come there. It's, it's all the time packed with girls playing volleyball, like for entire day on Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of um, you know, traffic you want there. Um, 
almost like overused and overbooked all the time. Yeah. You, you definitely want that. I mean, that would be the play I would make. I wonder, though, how much tax revenue that generates. Like, I don't know. The value the of the building. The building is just astroturf on ground. Right. And when you value the, the, the stuff in the building, that's where we generate tax revenue. What struck me about the one in Wellesley is I got to think of ice cream cost a fortune to make and that there's value in the pipes that keep it cold in, in the pool. I think the least taxable part of that thing in Wellesley is probably the side of it. My guess is John Stone's bubble doesn't generate property tax value, is my guess. Yeah, it brings in people, but John oh, okay. pockets that money, not okay. in the okay. um, And that's why I was seeing this wreck as maybe a little different because of the high tech stuff to keep an ice cream in the pool going, and that might generate more tax revenue. So there's a uh, facility in Northboro, it's right behind uh, the Arrive Westboro building, it's called Teamworks. Yes. Mm -hmm. that? mm -hmm. So that's got soccer, I've never been in it, but it's got soccer, it's got an outdoor pool, it's got an outdoor climbing wall. Mm -hmm. right. It is like four kicks in Marlboro yeah. in that regard. Yeah. They so also have summer camps some and daycares. And right. Exactly. I don't know if that's something more in line what... Right. I'd be interested in asking them what they... Pay the taxes. That's a good point. Because I think that I think it's nice to find stuff that our town loves, but I think when we're thinking about zoning, we're also thinking about how do we generate revenue for the town. And I think that we can think of things people would like that generate no revenue. Mm -hmm. And then we've lost that land, which I think is what we are saying too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, I mean so once once thing. it's gone, it's gone. It's right. I, it'll take, you know, a generation to get it back again. And I would imagine the soccer bubble is easier to take away than storage, which once it's there, it's never leaving. And it's not going to generate. Okay. So I think the point I, I think I'm agree. Well, so, so the other about thing. what we think about putting in those places. Yeah, so the John Smith concept is more low end than what you were talking about in Wellesley. Um, and if you look at the 80 South Street as an example, I mean, I think they were valuing that at like five and a half million. And so if you tried to put like a John Smith concept into that, it just doesn't work. It, you know, financially, it doesn't gen generate enough revenue to justify the expense of that property. The property's already at a higher level. Mm hmm so, is there a reason why we have difficulty attracting places like Urban Air or something like that? Because the Urban Air trampoline park, like open in Billingham, it's in the middle of nowhere. Yes. But half of Hop Hopkinton, every time I go there, I see all. It's a all very of cheap, the cheap piece of land. That's the reason why. Mm -hmm. mm. Mary, I think at the beginning of this term, uh, we we're going to look into. I think maybe it was you, Ron, that said that you thought there was a connection between profitability and land value. I think I missed that meeting when I asked about it because I saw it in a minute. So You're I, talking I about assessed that. values? Yes, and that the profitability of a business enhances the assessed taxable value of a property. The, the town assessor can, can apply... The Very town assessor can, can apply right. two Ron out of three me. different assessment valuations to a particular property. It could be revenue generation, it could be fair market value, and there's a third one that escapes me. Cost, and replacement it's cost. The, the assessor can basically assess it any way that the assessor chooses to, but the amount of income that a building is generating is there, but the, a lot of these South Street buildings that have been vacant um, the assessor applies an imputed as if this building were 70% occupied and values it at that rate. The only thing that vacant buildings don't generate for us are personal property, right. the, all the equipment that's inside. Mm -hmm. So just because a building is vacant doesn't mean that we're not getting any revenue from it because it's still being assessed <laughs> at, a, at a pretty high rate. I, I didn't know that. That's good to know. Unless you're the owner of that property sitting with them, <laughs> yeah. But it's but there there is a tie-in to revenue generated from the building, and how that how that property is assessed. Um, I have one request for. I think this was besides the the ta the, the list of, of private roads, but. 
No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just, I think it was related to that. I thought there was something else that I wanted to ask you for, but um, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 guess not, no. <laughs> okay. Um, fire sprinklers is something that um, I'd like to take up relatively soon because this is something that um, we're suggesting to put into to a place that is not a zoning bylaw, so it doesn't go through town meeting. Um, but we definitely need to get the input from um, the fire safety folks. Um, but uh, based on our meeting last time, those of you who were here, um, we did discuss it and um, just in. No, that wasn't last time. It was the time two before, times. two times ago. Okay. Yes, <laughs> um, we did discuss it, and um, just in general, and and talked about um, having it subdivision regs and where it would go and what kind of encouragement to to add there for um, uh, for developers to consider. What's the carrot yeah. for so, this? Yeah. So the yeah, the carrot being um, when um, a development needs to have longer than normal um, roads and or driveways, um, that this is something that they need to consider. Um, yeah. So, but it's obviously not something that we can mandate or we want to mandate. Um, it's just something we want them to consider. So, so we really need to think about how to make that wording encouraging, um, and people won't just dismiss it out of hand. You know? Do we so. have any idea what it costs to do this residential sprinkler system? We can find that out. On a square foot basis, because it would really be helpful to understand what kind of a yeah. Care it needs to be put in place. Yeah, I just need to go back into the um, the website that has all this um, this information on it. It has really, really robust information. So, um, but Did I will say I'll that, get back uh, to you. Given that this would be for new homes that were getting constructed, right? Potentially, the cost would be one baked into the cost of the home, but because everything is already under construction, it may not be a right but huge they probably should have some kind of a benchmark of what the cost per square foot is of the new home That's so true. that you get an idea of what the carrot has to look like in order to get the developer to go in that direction because remember we don't have the ability to say you absolutely have to do this right it's right. more of a, a carrot you know yep incentive right. right but we also had said that again we speculated that the developer could in his brochure say this has this high-tech mm -hmm. system as one of the attractions mm -hmm. while selling the home. Not sure who's right, going but there's a lot of things for selling the home. So I'm, I'm talking about like you know when this came up before the ZBA, um, I, a very specific was the entrance of my street. Actually, two little small houses that were replacing two little cottages, and it was 20 feet from the fire hydrant. Like that didn't make any sense to me because that's an unusually high expense for a small house, so, you know. Yeah. So that didn't make any true, sense. True, true. But when we're talking about an, a big house, like on Pond Street or someplace like that, where you've got to go a long distance off the street where the fire hydrant is, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Especially because now what he was saying is that the materials are so different today. They're so much more um, toxic when they burn than right. they used to be. Yeah. That, that was... Crazy. Yeah, I'm kidding. Definitely. All right. So, did anyone have any other ideas for us to add to our work plan or highlight? I'd like to do, to take up the idea of adjusting parking in industrial A and B mm -hmm. to the type of use rather than the type of zoning. Mm -hmm. So, different types of businesses might be able to have significantly less parking requirements and allowing them to better utilize the... That's smart. 
that, yeah. that and, is definitely and I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that, but just make some adjustments. So right now it's all parking by zoning as opposed to business type. Mm -hmm. Right. So can someone volunteer to do a little research on that, where it's done in zoning. other municipalities, that sort of thing? So it is on our work plan. So um, I mean, I'm just I, highlighting it. I don't know if anybody has done that. Yeah. Well, so I know, like in the shopping center world, we um, most towns will look at like restaurants different from retail. Right. So that's one example. But when we're talking about, I mean, this, I'm not an industrial broker, but when we're talking about an industrial building where you have a bunch of people manufacturing software versus having a big manufacturing plant, a big piece of machinery that's taking up that space, then it's probably by, by person. Do you know what I mean? <coughs> Parking by per how many people, the occupancy. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Are you going in that direction? <coughs> I can jump in on that. Cambridge does it significantly. They do okay. it okay, by the very many uses uh, and they do it kind of like what you're explaining but they do it as if it's this type of office use or this type of industrial use it's then the the ratio is determined by either employee or square footage so if it's general office it's one parking space for every 500 square feet and if it's industrial but it's high-tech industrial or something you know pharmaceutical industrial it's one space per this many employees or this many square feet. Mm -hmm. um, so they do it kind of differently depending on the use and the town. And Cambridge is obviously doing that to reduce the number of parking required, hence the number of automobiles required, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, now that's how they've done it. But they've, I believe they've always done it by that. They've just reduced the ratio. Right. Now, do, does the city of Cambridge, do they also... Um, include like ideas about um, supplementary public transportation like electric buses do they do that like as a as a carrot if you supply this and you can reduce it and all that kind of thing or not really no not that I know of mm. could be a very exciting conversation I mean they do I believe if I remember correctly they do allow for reduction of parking if you're within a certain area of uh, public transit. Mm -hmm. I think it's usually like if you're within a subway mm -hmm. rather than a bus, um, but I, I don't know what the specifics are. And Cambridge is just one example. I'm sure there are many oh, others. Yeah. Good. All right. Who would like to look more into that? Any excited volunteers? I'll work on it. I'll work on it too. Okay. Good shop guidance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Good. Okay. Well, I think that's good for tonight, unless. Just, uh, just one more yes. thing. I don't know if we already discussed it. There's something that last uh, year Rakal had brought up about so certain permits can be swapped between zones and stuff like that. That sounded like an interesting mm -hmm. concept, but I don't think we looked into it. Yep. Oh, that's selling development rights? Yep. Yeah, so... Yeah, that's here someplace. Transfer of development rights. There you yeah, go. Transfer of development rights. Yes, that is here. Could that be something we can... Would it work? Learn about more thinking? about? I don't know if it would work, but... They do it in Framingham, right? Yeah, so... Mm -hmm. I think we should look into it more. There's a lot of things that just require more research. They're not... They're, <laughs> they're not low-hanging fruit. Okay. We need to talk schedule. Get your calendars out. All right. We need to avoid town meeting and election and so on. Um... And spring break, whenever mm -hmm. that happens to be, I can't remember. That's in April sometime, right? April 20th. Okay. Okay. So, you want to meet, meet in two weeks' time? 
We do it on Thursday? Oh, God. It's so confusing when we do it on Thursday. I know, but I'm, I, I signed up for a class on Mondays because we were on Thursdays, and now I'm like... No, I'm, but we were only on Thursdays for a very brief <laughs> period of time. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, if, I, if it, you're okay with me coming here late... Yeah, what time, what time can you join us? Between 7.15 and 7.30. We could start at 7.30. How will people feel about that? Sure. On the 16th? Yeah, on the 16th and um, on some subsequent weeks until your class is over. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying 7.30 on the 16th? 16th. 7.30. Yep. Okay. Well, I'd, you don't need to change it for me, but I'm just telling you, if I, if I show up here a little bit late, and I'll be... I like you being here. Hungry, but you know. We like so. you being here, yeah. <laughs> I. <laughs> okay. So is it 7 30? 7 on the 16th. Okay. And also the 30th? People good for the 30th? Sure. Same, 7 30? Yep, 7 30 as well. Um, okay, so. Oh, if. I don't know what the next planning planning board schedule is. Is it the 13th planning board? It's the no. of what? Hmm? Of what? April. Um, yes. Okay, because that would be our next meeting otherwise. So we're not going to meet on the April 6th. So we would meet on, nope, that's Patriots Day, um, April 20th. So... Do you want to move the 30th one to the 6th? We could. And then do the 6th and the 27th? Okay. So we're not what? doing March 30th now? Not so doing March 30th. That's a great idea. Oh, so March 30th got canceled? Okay. Yeah. Well, just that, adjust oh, no, it No, I to think that's a great idea. I'm sorry. I'm because sorry. then we could do it once every three weeks since yeah. since planning board moves around on us. So March 30th did get canceled. Right? So April 6th is the next one? John has a question here. Yeah, that's actually my question. So I just <laughs> put in the... March 30th date. Is that not a we date anymore? Okay, so, so that's We were just be talking planned. about bumping it to. Okay, so that's actually going to be April Monday the 6th. Monday the 6th, okay. Because planning board is not doing anything that week. And then we can't meet on the 20th. So we can meet. No, and we can't meet on the 27th because. Oh. oh, wait a minute. Planning board says possibly cancel for know your vote because know your vote is that I night. I don't think they're canceling. They're not canceling. Okay. I think know your 27th. vote got moved to the 28th or 29th. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Or or they're still holding it and, and Muriel planning board is just going to yeah. yeah. go ahead anyhow. I think Gary Trendle agreed to go to know your vote. Okay, so maybe that's what it was. I think that's so what all we have is April 6th so far, right? No. Yes. March, April 6th. March, 16th. March, March 16th. March 16th and April 6th. Yes. It looks like 16. that is all we're going to manage until <laughs> well, right. 7, March 16th and April 6th. Okay. Town meeting is when? May, May 4th. Okay. Okay. Same day as all the AP exams for my kids. Oh, May 4th is town meeting, is it? May 4th, 5th, and 6th. Yes. What do you mean, 5th and 6th? <laughs> May 4th, 5th, and 6th. <laughs> so Cinco de Mayo is going to be It usually meeting. goes three days. Oh, so be perfect well, the last time I attended was that special meeting. That's why. Oh. Do you think we'll have as many articles as we had last year? I don't know. <laughs> Total? Yeah. There's not an insignificant amount of articles. <laughs> not an insignificant uh, okay. amount. I love your non-committal. Oh, I'm um, foreshadowing flu. Okay, so <laughs> generally a good idea to put it down from 7 to 11 p.m. for three days running. Okay. And then we're good. <laughs> we can be get people to move faster by telling them it's Cinco de Mayo. We have to <laughs> <laughs> Serve margaritas. <laughs> um, okay, so... So we can't meet then. When is, um, oh, we can meet on town meeting now. So hang on. I'm trying to get this in here properly. All right. Okay. So planning board is meeting on May 11th. So we can meet the 18th. 
May 18th. Are you still in your class at that point? Or can we go back to seven? <laughs> it's all on you, dear. May 18th, hang on. So that's a, roughly a six week gap, four, five week? Five week gap. <coughs> so you want to do it at seven o'clock on May 18th? Okay. That way I can get to bed earlier. Yeah, no, I. I <laughs> Okay. In general, we May haven't 18. gone to 9 o'clock except from the very beginning, so, I mean. Okay. Is that good for everybody? Yep. Mm -hmm. That gets us through town meeting, and. Okay. Uh, so, 7 on the 18th? Is that what we decided? 7 o'clock. Right. It's just 7.30 for the next two meetings on March 16th in two weeks and three weeks after that, April 6th. And then we go for five, five weeks. But it'll seem like we're meeting because we'll be at town meeting together. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, that'll wear us out for a couple of weeks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we need to um, approve the minutes. Everyone have a chance to review those? Any comments? Okay. I'll entertain a motion to approve. Second. Second. <laughs> okay. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Um, and I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Yeah, second. Okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, I was there. Um, <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, good. Thank you very much.